tell you what, if it cruises this nice all the time, I'm going to be a very happy person. Welcome back builders. In today's video we've got three big ticket items that we'll be testing for the first time. We've got the Gemini rims from Will Kid. We've got the CNC custom Minarelli head from Smolik Performance and the ported vertical Minarelli cylinder from DLH Performance. We're going to have a full breakdown of the build as it stands at the moment along with some future upgrades that are on the way and some issues that we're still having with the bike. As we break in the new cylinder, I'll be taking you guys for a ride in the invisible sidecar to enjoy the fresh green scenery. So we'll be right back, just sit back and enjoy the ride. First item up on our list today are these Gemini rims, and shout out to Tan from the Discord server for making me aware of their existence. At the time of recording, the full Gemini wheel set comes in at $350. Now it's up to you to decide whether or not that's worth it, but these are a set of wheels that you'll probably never replace, as they are very beefy and specifically designed for motorized bikes. However, if you simply need the rear wheel, which is usually the problem area on motorized bikes, you can pick it up for $199. I won't be covering everything going for these rims, but a few of the key features are thick double-walled rims, a CNC custom rear hub that's specifically designed to mate up to a CNC sprocket, thick 11 gauge spokes that come true right out of the box, sealed bearings in the front and back that do not require adjustment, thicker axles that are going to be harder to bend under rough riding situations, and at least for me, every piece of mounting hardware I needed to adapt them to my bike, along with other setups. Now with the rear wheel using a thicker 12mm axle, do keep in mind that you'll probably have to shave a bit of material away from your rear dropouts to make them fit. Although it is deceptive, it was a very minimal amount of material that I removed from the top of the dropouts, so they would slide right in. The front wheel bearings are optimally designed for a 20mm through axle, but do include spacers to mount it to standard dropouts on cheaper forks. Personally, when I consider the fact that rear wheels are always troublesome and replaced relatively often on motorized bikes, I find this to be worth the price as I never see myself having to replace this one. I also take into consideration the fact that a decent wheel set on something like Amazon will run you about 200 bucks, and you're paying about $100 extra here for a application specific wheel set. I also note that he hand builds each set as they're ordered, so keep that in mind when you're placing your order. Mine came relatively quick, I think I got it in less than two weeks, so I take that as a bonus, as he didn't realize who they were going to when I ordered them. If you've used these rims before, let me know in the comments what you decided to go with for tires and how well they've worked out for you. 
At the moment I'm using the Maxxis hookworms which are 2.5 inches wide and I'm having chain clearance issues. This bike's always been a bit tight when it comes to chain clearance but with these wider rims I believed it allowed the tires to expand a little bit more which amplified the issue. I'll probably try 2.3 inch wide tires and see if that fits the bill. I did reach out to Will Kidd on his Gemini Facebook page, but have not received a response on tire recommendations yet. I'll let you know if he responds in the future. That's just the quick and dirty rundown of the Gemini wheels, but I'll leave a link in the description if you want more details or to check them out yourself. While doing some digging for information about these wheels, I noticed that Will is working on a prototype charging system for the two-stroke motors. I hope that he's working on this as a potential sale product and not just a personal item, because myself and a lot of my viewers would probably be interested in a dedicated charging system that bolts right up to these motors. So Will, if you're listening, let us know if that's something you're working on as a sale product. Next up is the custom CNC head from Smolik Performance. Now I will admit there are two main reasons why I purchased this head and it really doesn't have anything to do with performance. One is this has the best cooling profile I could see out of all the options as the design scoops air in towards the cylinder and has massive fins for a lot of surface area. I've been having overheating issues with my Minarellis and this was to help cure that issue. We rode 25 miles today, and I didn't have any soft seizures, which had been common for me so far. So as far as I can tell, it's doing its job. Second, as I also wanted to help one of the U.S. sellers of custom parts for motorized bikes. He's one of the few. Now I'm certain that the performance with the dome profile on this head, which is specifically designed for Minarelli cylinders, is spot on, as his motors are always bringing home trophies, but I couldn't tell you one way or the other. I got it for a very specific reason, to keep the motor cool and that's what it is doing. Also note that he uses o-rings instead of gaskets which seal a lot better and are not quite as finicky if you don't have a perfectly decked cylinder. He includes three with the head but these are cheap and easy to find all over the internet. They're also available with eight and six millimeter thick stud patterns and my cylinder is using eight millimeter studs. Although I'm not sure if there would be a performance gain, it looks like you'd be able to match this up to a standard G4 cylinder with a China doll piston, as the stud patterns are the same. Just keep in mind, whatever spark plug you use and make sure it doesn't hit the piston. And the price tag of this might not justify using it on a G4, it is an upgrade you can hold for a Minarelli in the future. Now I can't leave this subject without saying that the CNC work on this head is spot on. It is absolutely gorgeous and I prefer this aggressive style over the round domes that are strapped on top of a lot of cylinders. With this one it doesn't look like I put a flying saucer on top of my motor. Last big ticket item on our list today is the ported vertical Minarelli cylinder from DLH Performance. Up until now I've been using a stock Minarelli cylinder and I've been very happy with the performance so far as it's been the most powerful bike I've ever been on. With this ported cylinder it's a big difference. This thing pulls harder than my 250 Dual Sport and the bike only has one gear. It's a bit scary because if you open the throttle up all the way it wants to lift the front tire, something I was very careful not to do as we all know how that ended up the first time with the Phantom 85. Now I get it, there's always going to be something more powerful than what I test on the channel. And there'll be an individual in the comments saying you haven't tried real power until you've stuck such and such on your bike. But when a fresh cylinder on a 36.2 sprocket does this on the first tank of gas... That makes me happy. It's hard to convey my enthusiasm about this cylinder, but the port work is gorgeous as we've seen in previous videos. It's better than anything I could have done by hand, and these are iron cylinders, so that's saying something because they're not as easy to bore out as an aluminum G4. I don't want it to sound like I'm leaning towards one side of the fence or the other, but I can't find any issues with the cylinder itself. Darcy, you did good work on this one. Just to put it simply and not waste anyone's time, it's a Minarelli so it's got power, and it's ported so it has more power. Now the biggest area of controversy between the Smolix cylinder setup and the DLH is their intake. With the DLH using a G2 reed adapter, and the Smolik using an adapter which I believe uses the standard Minarelli reeds. 
I've sat back in the comments section and on the Discord server to listen to everybody's reason as to why one's better than the other, with the majority seem to leaning towards the Smolik intake over DLH. Now, I've heard multiple reasons as to why one's better than the other, and I'll be talking about them here, and then I'll give you my opinion, as well as what we're going to be testing in the future. DLH claims that by using a G2 reed setup, you've isolated the carburetor from the majority of the heat produced by this hot cylinder, and it does get quite a bit hotter than a G4, and that makes sense to me, although we will be testing it with a heat gun in the future versus the Smolik intake. I'm not sure how much of a difference this will make, but getting cooler fuel into the motor is always going to be a good thing in my opinion, although admittedly this has not saved me from soft seizures in the past. I've had a few individuals claim that you're restricting airflow by using a G2 reed, but you're still restricted by the carburetor anyways. In my situation, a VM18, I believe, is 18 millimeters, so you're not going to magically get any more airflow into the cylinder by using a different setup. If anything, using a wider intake might hurt intake velocity, but again, I'm not a professional here, and I really don't know how much of a difference that's going to make. Now I'll try the Smolik intake versus DLH, we'll test for temperature and see if there's a big difference on the carburetor side, and if there's any noticeable performance difference using one over the other. At the moment, here's my personal opinion about what I'm using. I honestly don't care for the G2 Reed, simply because of its complexity. You're adding a lot of unnecessary components, in my opinion, to this Minarelli cylinder. Having used the very simple intake adapter on my Southern Custom Hybrid, which would be more similar to Smolix as opposed to DLHs, I prefer it over the G2 reed. The steel reeds seal a bit better on that, and they're not quite as finicky when adjusting the intake setup. So I'm sure the Discord server and comment section will continue to explode with reasons why one should be used over the other, but until I've tested it thoroughly myself, I will not knock either. With these big ticket items out of the way, I'd like to tell you which ones I think are the best value, in my opinion, or which ones I would purchase first if I could only choose one. Then we'll cover some of the smaller upgrades on the bike, along with a few of the issues we're still having. And finally, I'll give you a final summary of my thoughts and opinions about the build so far. But first, let me show you guys a few highlights of today's first ride on these upgraded parts.
real nice. This bumpy as all hell. Now on to a rundown of the build and where it sits so far. The frame is a felt faker style. It was originally an F0 from Bikeberry, although it has had most of its parts replaced by now. These are some custom bars that were originally on a Cranbrook, which most of you know that we just hacked in half to give us a bit more of a lift. We have a dual pull brake lever, an aluminum anodized throttle housing. On the left side we're using an anodized blue kill switch. And I really like this kill switch. The build quality feels real nice and the button press is real crisp. We have a bar in mirror. Now these are usually good the first time you put them in, but if you ever have to take these out and reinsert them, they're kind of a pain. On top of our original triple tree forks, which will be replaced soon with zooms, is a tachometer that you should stay away from at all costs. The thermostat on it stopped working immediately and the reading is kind of finicky. This is one of the OG clutch levers that actually works, and it's kind of a necessity when you're using these high pressure clutches to get as much throw as possible. On top of the front wheel, we have our hookworm tires. And one thing I didn't point out earlier is that these front Gemini wheels have a setup for dual disc brakes, if that's your style. At the moment, the front and rear calipers are still the stock mechanical calipers that are getting replaced with hydraulics. They just didn't arrive in time for the video. Our exterior ignition system is a BBR Tuning Stage 2 kit, which is capping off an NGK B6HS. The system is mated up to the PowerStorm ignition system from DLH. His kit does include its own standalone CDI, but I'm using the BBR Tuning. What I'm using from his kit is the heavy duty magnet and magneto. Our VM18 carburetor G2 reed head and cylinder are on top of a Zeta 80 Firestorm bottom end, which has been plugged with the Super Clutch from DLH Performance. And this time around we are using the CDH lower engine mount to help this clamp onto the frame a little bit safer. We've gone with a smaller front chain ring. I can't remember how many teeth, but I'll try to leave a link in the description when I find it. And these are some Fokker pedals, some nice studs on them to help you keep a good grip. We match this up with a 22 tooth single speed to make it a little easier to pedal from a dead stop along with a 36 tooth drive sprocket and a 415H chain. This is our modified cut and welded jog pipe. The CNC adapter did lift the entire engine, including the pipe, so unfortunately we had to switch the rear seat to something a little less comfy. The quad spring setup we were running before was very comfortable, but unfortunately the springs were tapping against the pipe with the CNC adapter. And yes, that is Velcro and rubber strapping the silencer to the frame. Why? Because it's simple and it works. Well, as suspected, we're getting a little bit of chain rub. Nothing severe, but I can see the marks. I don't know if you guys can see them on camera. So just to be on the safe side, we're going to call it a day. I've never had a chain puncture a sidewall. But then again, anytime I notice these marks, I don't keep going long enough to find out what'll happen. <laughs> When it comes to the three major upgrades we've added to the bike so far, I would say that hands down the Gemini wheel set is the best value if you're looking for an update. Simply pulling them out of the box, they're one of the few parts I could tell immediately were good quality and not going to give me any issues. They're incredibly beefy, and being specifically made for motorized bikes gives me much more confidence when riding. 
Second, choosing between the small egg head or the DLH ported cylinder, I would say the small egg head is a great option if you're having overheating issues, and in my opinion, an aftermarket head on a Minarelli is something that's almost a must. At least if you're like me, and you don't completely know what you're doing. This is not to take anything away from the performance gains you'll get with DLH's ported cylinder. It's definitely got balls. It's just that for me, I prefer to choose the reliability before I go with performance. I almost have this build right where I want it. It's got more than enough power for me to ever use, and it looks like it's going to be a nice cruiser, as it handled today's 25 mile ride with no issues whatsoever. Except for one, but it's been an issue that's plagued this engine ever since I put it on a bike, way back when we were using a G4 cylinder and totally different intake and carburetor setup. Is this motor just for some reason does not like to idle? I personally think it has something to do with the bottom end or maybe the crank. I've replaced seals and gaskets several times, resealed everything, and gone through several different intakes and cylinders, as well as different carburetors, and it's still giving me the same issues. It's as if it's got an air leak, so I suspect maybe there's an issue with the case. Maybe there's a fine crack in it somewhere or a stud that's poked through a wall that I just haven't found. So we're going to go ahead and replace this bottom end. I also suspect that possibly the slightly out of true crank is causing an issue with the crank seals, especially once the motor heats up. I really don't know. Every time I take a guess at something and replace a part, it still has the same issue. I think this motor's just cursed. But I don't think it has anything to do with our intake cylinder head, so on. Although it is possible that maybe a G2 reed is just not great in my situation. So we'll be testing a different intake as well if the bottom end replacement does not fix the issue. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.